It's the 1990s and the gaming landscape is dominated by side-scrolling platformers, first-person shooters and adventure games. Soon these will be joined by another genre, real-time strategy gaming. As we approached the new millennium, we were blessed with a series of legendary, genre-defining RTS titles, many of which have stood the test of time. Even among such stiff competition, there are three titles which stand out and are the focus of this video. What made these three games so special? How do they play today? And what legacy have they left in the real-time strategy genre? Unit lost. Unit lost. Where better to begin than Westwood Studios, the developer that kickstarted the entire genre? Although by no means the first, Westwood's Dune 2 is perhaps the earliest example of the archetypal mouse and keyboard PC RTS. Released in 1992, the game set in place several gameplay conventions which are with us to this day, such as exploring the map through a fog of war, micromanaging your units using a mouse and keyboard, collecting resources and building a base. The game's massive critical and commercial success paved the way for the growth of the genre through the 1990s. Straight away the team started working on its own intellectual property, a game they described as the net result of their Dune 2 wishlist, the things they wanted to implement but couldn't. The resulting title, Command and Conquer, released in 1995 to rave reviews and smash hit sales. Command and Conquer improved upon, in every way possible, the gameplay foundation set by Dune 2. The audio and visuals were much improved, as was the responsiveness of the controls. This was aided by drag selection, context sensitive clicking and the ability to queue commands. The storytelling in the single player campaign was much improved, aided by scripted scenarios within the missions. And of course, those legendary live action videos featuring an ensemble cast of Westwood employees and one professional actor. Now while it's very easy to make a case for Command and Conquer to be featured in this video, it's actually a sequel Red Alert which I want to focus on. Like The Godfather or The Empire Strikes Back, Red Alert is one of those rare cases where the sequel absolutely eclipses the original in all facets. Following the success of Command and Conquer, there was a proliferation of copycat style games and Red Alert launched into a very crowded market. Despite this, it managed to be head and shoulders above all its competition and its predecessor. While perhaps not innovating to any great degree, what the game did do is everything very, very well. Visually, the game was very appealing, not necessarily because of technological advancements from Command and Conquer, but more so its design. Red Alert boasted an expanded roster of units with compelling visuals and improved animations. These visuals were coupled with an award-winning soundtrack from Frank Kaplaki, which won several Video Game Soundtrack of the Year awards from leading publications such as PC Gamer. When you consider that the Command & Conquer soundtrack is regarded as truly exceptional, it really is a striking achievement to have improved upon that with Red Alert. One way in which Red Alert really stood out from its competitors was the storytelling within the single player campaign. Each mission was bookended by videos and these would be different depending on whether you'd failed or succeeded to complete your objectives. These were a combination of CGI and live action, now featuring professional actors as opposed to Westwood staffers. Compared to its predecessor, these characters were very much larger than life and the scenes depicted were very over the top and melodramatic. This style of video would very much become a hallmark of the Command & Conquer franchise and with Red Alert, Westwood really started to find their groove in terms of making these. The in-game menus between each mission also added to the immersion and storytelling. With each success, you would capture enemy territory as you marched across Europe towards final victory. And the real standout amongst its competitors, an improvement upon Command & Conquer, was really the scripting and custom objectives within the single player missions You'd have time-based escort missions, you'd have rescue missions, reinforcements and various win conditions such as having to escort units across a bridge which you would fail if the bridge was destroyed. The end result is a very tight, coherent experience 
which does a great job of telling the story and immersing you within the experience. While perhaps not very impressive looking at it today, this was a high watermark at the time in terms of storytelling within the RTS genre. Another standout feature relative to its peers at the time was definitely the computer AI and the unit pathfinding. It was very rare that a unit would fail to reach its destination. So what legacy did Red Alert leave in the genre, and where did Westwood go from here? It's hard to overstate the importance of Command and & Conquer and Red Alert upon the genre. They largely single-handedly sparked a massive boom in RTS game development, and indeed for a long time, games were described as Command & Conquer clones. In a story which has been mirrored hundreds of times across the industry, Westwood was acquired by Electronic Arts in 1998, and despite fighting fiercely to maintain an independent corporate culture and make the best games possible, a couple of commercially disappointing titles in early 2000s led to the studio being closed and merged into EA amidst hundreds of layoffs and losing many key people, essentially resulting in a watering down of the magic of Westwood. From this point on, games in the Command & Conquer franchises tended to take absolutely zero risk regarding gameplay choices. Everything was very vanilla and they didn't innovate at all. The only area they really tried to push things was still in the cutscenes, where they became increasingly elaborate and more and more mainstream actors were featuring. Sadly, modern Command & Conquer titles bear little resemblance to the classics, and I would say there's not much value to be had in playing them to be honest. They've used the IP and they've plastered Command & Conquer upon any number of titles, even cash grab mobile style games featuring loot crates and predatory gambling mechanics. But that's not to diminish the legacy of the original. I do think Red Alert deserves its place on the RTS genre Mount Rushmore. Released during perhaps the most competitive era for the genre, during a period in which record numbers of RTS titles were being published every year, Red Alert stands head and shoulders above almost all of its contemporaries and really represents one of the finest examples of the genre, a really, really polished game which holds up even today. StarCraft is a game which needs almost no introduction. Terms such as legendary are tossed around rather loosely these days, but it's definitely fair to say that StarCraft is a legendary RTS title, which transcends not only the genre, but computer gaming entirely. The story of StarCraft begins at Blizzard Entertainment, who are riding high in the mid-90s, following the success of their RTS title Warcraft, and its hugely influential sequel, Tides of Darkness. The developers were keen to build a new RTS franchise, but they wanted to make sure they didn't merely just create Warcraft in space. Despite commencing the project in 1995, StarCraft was not released until 98, which represented significant delays to the original timeline. After sharing an early build at E3 1996, and receiving largely negative feedback, the team went back to the drawing board, significantly reworking the engine. When the game finally launched in 98, followed quickly by its expansion pack Brood War towards the end of the same year, there was significant hype and anticipation for the titles. So how did the heavily delayed StarCraft, launching into a sea of other RTS titles, manage to stand out as being something truly special? The vast majority of RTS titles from the time featured two symmetrical races with very similar units and playstyles, making balance relatively trivial. StarCraft took a very different approach. They were three distinct races, with absolutely no overlap between them in terms of units, buildings, or even playstyle at all. They were very, very different experiences, including their own soundtrack and user interface. This meant that StarCraft had a much wider array of units and gameplay mechanics, and increased replayability relative to its peers, but it did introduce the real challenge of trying to balance these three distinct races. It is perhaps StarCraft's greatest achievement that it truly did manage to balance the three races, as evidenced by the enduring pro scene. Blizzard were wise to create a map editor and to share this with the community, because where there were slight balance issues, the map makers could compensate by giving advantages to the weaker races in terms of map design. Underpinned by Battle.net, Blizzard's framework which allowed for easy matchmaking and took away a lot of the faff of early internet multiplayer. It was clear to see that with its three distinct, well-balanced races, the multiplayer of StarCraft was going to be a smash hit. 
The multiplayer experience of StarCraft really was unrivaled at the time. The level of strategic depth and tactical choice was just staggering, and you could also play custom maps. There was a very healthy and growing community map scene. For its multiplayer alone, StarCraft has to be considered as one of the most important RTS titles of all time, and arguably the most important game in terms of professional competition, period. What really pushes StarCraft to a level beyond is the fact that it's not just a multiplayer game. Taking the original and Brood War into account, you have six full single-player campaigns to sink your teeth into. Written by Blizzard legend Chris Metzen, the story and the dialogue really was top-notch, really engrossing. It was told to us through a combination of cinematic videos, pre-mission briefings, and then scripted moments within the missions themselves, featuring high-quality voice acting. Similar to Command & Conquer Red Alert, this was very immersive. It created a coherent, almost cinematic feeling to the game. I think StarCraft also gave us glimpses into the magic to come from Blizzard's cinematics team. They really created some very compelling videos. In terms of influence and legacy, nothing can really rival StarCraft. In its heyday, the professional scene of StarCraft really was a sight to behold. Matches were played in front of live audiences numbering in the tens of thousands, and there were two dedicated TV channels in South Korea airing StarCraft games all day long. Predating anything like the League of Legends LCS by at least 10 years, there were pro teams featuring players living together, practicing, and high-level corporate sponsors for these teams, such as Samsung, SK Telecom, and even the South Korean military had a team. Apart from a short period where it could be argued that Warcraft 3 perhaps eclipsed it, StarCraft Brood War has been THE competitive RTS for the best part of 20 years. Many developers have tried to emulate the success of StarCraft, with finely balanced asymmetrical races and interesting gameplay interactions between them. Most, if not all, that have tried have failed, and if we're speaking in terms of competitive multiplayer, we can also count Blizzard amongst those who have failed. Launched in 2010, StarCraft II was a title which was carrying immense amounts of hype and anticipation, and I can't recall another game where I've ever been so excited about its launch. In terms of the soundtrack, the visuals, the storytelling, the single-player campaign, and the cinematics, StarCraft II was an absolute slam dunk. It was truly fantastic, and really represented the best of Blizzard. Following the successful blueprint from Brood War and Warcraft 3, the game's fantastic storyline was told through a combination of cinematic videos, pre-mission briefings, and then scripted moments within each mission themselves. The single-player campaigns within StarCraft II are extremely polished and fun to play, and they represent the finest example of storytelling within the RTS genre to this day. The key element of StarCraft Brood War, the multiplayer, the competitive gaming, the balance, that's where StarCraft II fell down and I could make an entire video, which could be an hour long, talking about the mistakes made. But to sum it up, I would say there was a fundamental lack of understanding on the part of Blizzard in terms of what had made Brood War successful as a multiplayer title. The professional scene in South Korea was regulated by KESPA. They were the ones which oversaw the Pro League, and the KESPA map creators were amongst the finest in the land. They were the ones that continued to keep Brood War balanced by making small tweaks to map balance. The relationship with Kesper was essentially bungled for StarCraft II's launch by Blizzard, and what transpired is that we ended up with StarCraft II and Brood War in direct competition, and we had no professional map makers contributing to the early StarCraft II tournaments. So, a game which was rough around the edges, balance-wise, was further hampered by some mediocre maps, to, to put it mildly. In addition to playing on substandard maps, the actual professional player pool was diminished because all of the exciting household name South Korean StarCraft pros continued playing Brood War in the pro leagues and the people playing StarCraft 2 were the, the B teamers and the foreigners, which are i.e. anyone not in South Korea basically. The poor games were further compounded by a few poor design choices, which essentially resulted in death balls where entire armies would move around in a single control group crash into each other, and damage per second was too high, so battles would resolve within 10 seconds, and usually there was no chance of a comeback. There was one decisive winner of the battle, and that person won the game. So, it was a pretty poor watch to be honest, and within it about 6 or 7 years, StarCraft Brood War had again overtaken StarCraft 2, 
as the preeminent RTS competitive title. At the time of making this video, Brood War has returned to being the most watched RTS title on streaming platforms, and I believe it also had the highest combined prize money this year in terms of professional tournaments. There's obviously still a huge interest in creating the competitive RTS of the future, and we're seeing this play out in front of us with titles such as Stormgate and Zero Space, and they're showing us just how difficult the task is. One prediction I can confidently make is that the competitive RTS of the future will not come from Blizzard, sorry to say. Despite the downfall of Blizzard, the fact remains that they managed to capture lightning in a bottle with StarCraft Brood War, and no other competitive RTS has come anywhere close to matching the success or quality of this game. I think the passage of time has only served to enhance the legacy of StarCraft. For each failed attempt to copy it, emulate it, replace it, we are reminded of just how uniquely special the original game is. The first release from newly formed studio Cave Dog Entertainment was a truly special game. For many members of the studio, this was the first title they'd shipped, and for those that had more experience, they'd mainly be working on baseball games and those designed for children. They also made a few key acquisitions from the closure of Squaresoft Seattle Studio, including legendary composer Jeremy Soule. So for many of the team, this would be the first RTS they'd ever worked on, which is perhaps part of the reason why the finished product was so innovative and fresh. The first thing I want to highlight about Total Annihilation is the classical soundtrack and the smart way it was integrated into the game. This would be one of Jeremy Soule's first projects within gaming, and he took quite a different approach, opting for classical music with a combination of rousing battle themes and sombre reflective pieces. If you listen to the CD from start to finish in order, it does sound a bit jarring as it jumps around seemingly randomly from these high energy to more reflective pieces. In the actual game this works far more effectively this is because they had some code implemented which essentially looked at the activity levels within the mission and would skip to the appropriate track based on what was happening. So you'd get a battle theme at the right time, and if you're rebuilding and recovering, you'd get one of the quieter tracks. Even today I find this impressive, but for 1997 it was absolutely staggering, and it really did set Total Annihilation apart from its contemporaries. The soundtrack was different, and the soundtrack was smart. One of the key metrics which people used to compare RTS titles at the time was how many different types of units could you produce. In this sense, nothing can compare to TA. It has hundreds of different types of units, ranging from walker kind of robots to tanks, amphibious tanks, flyers, and all kinds of naval vessels. There's also a huge selection of static defense, ranging from defensive lasers and missile turrets, all the way up to devastating doomsday weapons which can fire across half the map. There is a wide selection of artillery and missile launching type units and structures, which rely on line of sight to attack their targets. Compared to its peers, TA had an extremely advanced line of sight and terrain system, with these projectiles being modelled in real time. It was not unusual to see your missiles and artillery shells crash into the side of a mountain because enemy units had taken refuge behind it. In addition to having a huge roster of units, Army sizes were typically gigantic as well, and all of these units were realised in full 3D. Given that the other titles in this video have received some love in the form of high resolution remasters, TA perhaps doesn't look quite so impressive by comparison, but I can assure you at the time it looked fantastic. The developer's fresh perspective on the RTS genre extended through to the economy and resource management. The typical model at the time would involve collecting resources and then when you gave the instruction to build a unit or a building, the entire cost would be subtracted up front. If you lacked the resources to do this, production would not commence. TA took an innovative streaming approach to resources. Essentially you had energy and metal, and you had collection rates for the two. Across your various construction projects in your base, you would then have a rate at which these would be depleted, and if there was a shortfall, streaming of production would stop and would then continue in small spurts. The game would allow you to start projects which were far too expensive for your current income, and it was up to you as the player to manage all these competing interests, and you could do some really interesting things such as you could bring multiple workers onto one project and try to rush through a building as quickly as possible. So your speed of construction was really limited only by the rate of collection of resources. 
This made build orders extremely important, but it also gave lots of strategic choice to the player. So the economy and base building side of the game was very complex and adaptable, and unit counts were absolutely gigantic. So thankfully, the control system for this game is well beyond any of its rivals from the time. The queuing system for construction was extremely intuitive and nice to look at, and unit control was very, very responsive. I would also argue that the waypointing and patrol system for units was probably the first successful implementation of this in an RTS title. To summarise what I think is special about TA, it's basically everything the developers did which was different, based on their fresh perspective to the genre. This was an extremely ambitious and innovative project, and many of the features introduced for the first time immediately became genre mainstays. The legacy of Total Annihilation looms large over the RTS landscape. Total Annihilation marked the beginning of a new RTS subgenre, games which are characterised by hundreds of different types of units, extremely large army sizes, terrain modification, and the real-time modelling of projectiles, in addition to the streaming resource system. Roughly a decade after TA, we were treated to a spiritual successor in the form of Supreme Commander, which carried all of these features into the future and also introduced the idea of the strategic zoom, essentially being able to focus on the smallest of skirmishes and then zoom the map all the way out to be able to see the entire battlefield in a single view. There's still very much a healthy development scene within the subgenre, and there's a combination of fan-led and also studio development projects to create the subcom or TA title of the future. I previously made a video which went into much more detail, chronicling the history of the subgenre and also highlighting all the various projects which are coming to fruition. Although I framed it as a battle to replace Total Annihilation, things are actually very good spirited and there's lots of collaboration and cross pollination. There's very much an attitude of a rising tide will lift all boats within the subgenre. Although it's nice to look to the past and reminisce, the RTS genre is very much alive and kicking. And if you're interested in seeing some of the most exciting upcoming titles, take a look at the video below.